data set. And what we wanted to talk to you for a couple of these points, too, and this is very clear. We don't believe in that. It has to be very clear. Uh, when we look at the how this act is going to be enforced, it is by the Privacy Commissioner. The Privacy Commissioner himself has made comments to state that he needs this definition to be clear and concise. And without lack of, of, with lack of consistency and without clear guidelines on generally accepted best practices, there's a risk of inconsistency in anonymization methods across different organizations, leading to various levels of data protection and potential undermining privacy standards. And we had a few of those examples of, of where that's happened and why we're looking at this. And I think the bigger point, too, was looking across the board when we've had witnesses at the, the difference between anonymization and de-identification. And the problem we've had and the problem I had when we talked to witnesses and de-identification was in the definition it says a risk of identification of the individual still remains. And that's a major issue when we're talking about what we're, what we're trying to achieve here. And in privacy, it should be that individuals have the right that their private information is not just de-identified, not that there's a risk of that information being re-identified, that their information is completely anonymized or their information can be protected under this Privacy Act. I wanted to give two examples of where this happened in the past. And all of us recognize that uh, we have had our, our information breached, our privacy breached on many different occasions. I get emails on certain apps or even sometimes your banking or Netflix where there's an email that says your, your information has been compromised, please change your passwords. This happens all the time. Two examples, I'm going to give one American, one Canadian where this has happened and caused harm to consumers. Uh, in 2006, Netflix launched a competition known as the Netflix Prize, offering a million dollars prize to improve its recommendation algorithm by 10%. And Netflix released a data set containing movie ratings by anonymous users. However, researchers later demonstrated that it was possible to re-identify individuals in the data set using external information. In 2007, two individuals showed that by combining the Netflix data set with publicly available IMDB data, they could identify specific individuals and their movie preferences. This raised serious private concerns as it highlighted the risk of, of re-identification even when data is anonymized. In Canada, we had the breach of Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care's data breach in 2011. In this incident, the personal health information of thousands of Ontario residents was compromised due to inadequate, inadequate de-identification measures. The ministry had released health data to researchers for an analysis, but, but failed to su sufficiently anonymize the data, allowing individuals to be re-identified. As a result, sensitive information such as medical conditions, treatments, and hospital visits became accessible to unauthorized parties. And this breach raised serious privacy concerns and highlighted the importance of robust de-identification practices, especially when dealing with sensible, sensitive health data. The main point is we have to be clear and concise. We have to ensure that the Privacy Commissioner, who's raised concerns about this, this definition, does not see ambiguity when they're looking at this, but at the same time ensures that we have businesses who can't skirt the rules and, and be lenient with, with private, private data. And I think that's the main point we're making. Um, Mr. Shan, I think I asked you some questions already last time we were here. Um, I don't have the blues, so I, I will see if I ask this for it. But I think I asked you what general accepted best practices for anonymizing information was. If I haven't, can you please answer that? Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour la question. Um, Thank you, Chair, for the question. ...of generally accepted best practices is actually that it continues to evolve with the state of the technology. It's one of the reasons why we believe it's actually an important consideration uh, for inclusion within the Act, so that it continues to ensure that it meets the state of the art. Um, we actually have concerns that absent a commitment to generally accepted best practices, um, that organizations would actually not have uh, a, a North Star or a guide as to what they should actually be doing as it relates to the anonymization of information, and that there actually could be a plethora of approaches taken. And so generally accepted best practices um, would, would vary, uh, um, but uh, I think you'd find within industry uh, and within users um, a lot that they could turn to as it relates to that. And, and I can, um, so that would be my, my, my primary response. So 
you know, I guess at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're then uh, putting a definition in that is not defined in the act, correct? We're putting in a concept uh, in, into the act, um, which then tags along with, with the definition. So the definition remains anonymized as it appears and then has the concept of generally accepted best practices including to, uh, uh, along, alongside it. So I guess the, the biggest question then who is who? So who would be determining if the data was anonymized according to those generally accepted best practices? The department, the privacy commissioner, or is it a case of self-regulation? So Mr. Chair, I'd offer a couple of things. So. Uh, Two things. One, um, all of this is definitional, which means that it then relates to the powers and obligations that people would be scrutinized by as it relates to the enforcement of the Act. The enforcement of the Act is by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. So the determination as to whether or not someone had actually anonymized information for the purposes uh, of, uh, of meeting the test of generally acceptable best practices w would be one that would be determined by the, the Privacy Commissioner should there be concerns about a violation of the CPPA. Um, the, the conception of generally acceptable best practices, as I noted, appears within Quebec's law. It's also the approach that's consistent with what experts have called for. So the Canadian Anonymization Network, or CANON, is a not-for-profit organization with representatives from public, private, and health sectors in Canada, it includes the participation of experts in the field of de-identification and anonymization, including Statistics Canada. And they stated that the inclusion of the phrase generally accepted best practices will help future-proof the definition of anonymize as it sets a statutory obligation for organizations to consider the evolving de-identification techniques and standards that would sufficiently protect personal information for their industry and context. And we've heard from some of those witnesses, but it was the privacy commissioner himself who noted that this, this was not something that he'd like to see in there, especially if there was not... Uh, a clear and concise concept of, of who was setting those and, and what businesses knew the best practices were. Um, do we have other countries that uh, we've looked at? I know you've mentioned uh, Quebec, but did you look at other countries that had uh, generally accepted best practices in their legislation when it came to anonymization? The one I'm most familiar with, Mr. Chair, is, is Quebec's Law 25, which does make that, that um, I'm not sure of others. And from what we've seen, there aren't, there aren't many others, and the G GPPA does not have that in there. Um, when, it, when it came to um, consultation for this, we, we, of course, had many witnesses here at the committee. Um, and you met yourself personally with, with quite a few witnesses, is that correct, in the department? That's correct. Um, did you meet with all the witnesses that we had here at the committee? Uh, I'd have to review the witness list, but I'd say over the course of the years I've been within the department, I, it's probably likely that I've met with all of the witnesses that you've okay. had testimony and, and from. Did you meet with any witnesses more than others? Were there any that requested more meetings with you on this and other topics of this? Um, I'd have to review. I, I'd say in general, um, there's a strong representation from the academic sector and a strong representation from industry. Um, our, of that, we did know that you met with the Canadian Marketing Association, who've been strong advocates for this kind of language uh, being included in the bill 10 times. Um, are, you, are you aware that they're, they're trying to keep, you know, so reasonable uh, or to, to keep general best practices in, in this in this definition? I, I know that that's one of the issues that the CMA has raised uh, in, in their submission to this committee. Okay, and just, I know we've had some testimony, but just because you've met with them 10 times, are they stating that this is going to hurt their business if, if they don't have this included, or were there any concerns that this definition of anonymization uh, could be too strict for them? Um, no, I, I think you'll find the, pers the, 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 the specifics within their submission and as well as, as, as within their own testimony, but I think their um, view is that they, I don't want to paraphrase their view, but I understand it, that, that they would like a standard by which they could actually n know um, uh, where to follow and they want to be able to ensure that there are standardized approaches, which is why they, they believe generally acceptable best practices, I think, is, is, is helpful. Um, in terms of how that's going to be identified. So generally, you know, um, accepted best practices. Uh, 
you know, is the department going to have those best practices? Is that something where if it was an included, there would be a list somewhere that public and businesses could find that? So I think there's two considerations for that. One is there is uh, industry standards that um, can be referenced and leveraged, and there's a specific opportunity for that within the CPPA, and then there's the opportunity as well for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner to issue guidance. Sure, but like to my point, I guess if the Privacy Commissioner is stating in the onset here that this, this provides no guidance, that it's going to be ambiguous. Um, I'm just wondering where it's supposed to live. And, and I go back and our, our fail safe is to go to the Privacy Commissioner because at the first and foremost, the, the whole premise of this act where we're coming from on this side is that privacy needs to be a fundamental right and there should be no amb ambiguity. And if it, if it comes to the fact that some organizations want this wording in to provide more uh, elbow room, that's not really what we're here for. We're here to protect privacy's fundamental, or, or Canadians' fundamental private rights. And when we look at this bill, I can't see any reason why, so far, except for it being in Quebec's legislation, that we're seeing it as a best practice anywhere else to include this language, except for the fact that some of these organizations, like the Canadian Marketing Association, are saying that it's not going to allow them to collect and, and uh, be free with more inf or Canadians' private information. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll leave this here just so the rest of the committee can come in. Um, but uh, to our side, we can't see why, why this amendment would be here. Thank you. Mr. Williams, Mr. Garon, uh, la parole est à vous. Ensuite, uh, je... Mr. Garon, you have the floor, then Mr. Massey, Turnbull, Genereux, and Burke. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to follow up what uh, Deputy Williams just said, they introduced a notion of best practices, which has evolved quite rapidly. We've seen it at the University of Toronto, who appeared before the committee. Uh, it, it was effective a few years ago, but currently doesn't appear to be. So they'd like to introduce into the law the concept, not the definition. And, of course, if there's any uh, problem and uh, if it's uh, put, be put before the courts uh, because of the uncertainty, why was a concept of best practices adequate? And we were told, uh, well, there's no definition. It's a matter of interpretation. If you end up before the courts, it's, it's problematic. Uh, this doesn't seem to uh, provide any uncertainty. There seems to be a certain consensus uh, on how businesses will interpret that. Well, the concept of uh, best practices need, it has to have an objective, and the objective is to uh, make it Im almost impossible to re-identify, re-establish the identity if it's been anonymized. So best practices, the best practices available in order to attain the objective, uh, maintain that s anonymity status. So uh, it, it's a method. Uh, there's no real objective. It's a method to compare a process. Well, I'm talking about the uh, best interest of the child, of course. There was an objective. There is That is an objective, particularly with children. So why? In some cases, uh, anonymity and ambiguity is okay, but in other cases, not. To your knowledge, is there one technique, an, an only technique, that would allow 100% guarantee that uh, individuals would not be able to be identified? Or is there still a risk? Well, it depends on case by case. There's a lot of different uh, applications of this data, of uh, individual private information, and a lot of different contexts. Uh, a, a technical environment, of course, uh, allows uh, some slippage, if you will. Uh, 
So I'm not an expert in the field, so... Yes, there has been techn technological evolution of these uh, methods. What I'm trying to have you state clearly, if there's a clear objective of to not identify or re-identify, In my previous uh, life, uh, I know that there is really no single uh, technique that's 100% uh, watertight. There's a lot of ways you can re-establish the identity of individuals. So what is the adequate acceptable level of risk? And who determines uh, the basket of technologies? Because there is a basket of technologies. There's not a single one. Uh, and it has to match and be uh, compliant with a certain acceptable level of risk. But who determines? Uh, other than, you know, depending on uh, good faith. Uh, well, there is a definition of uh, anonymization. And uh, the in, in the implementation process of this act, uh, the Privacy Commissioner determines if an organization has, in fact, uh, respected and uh, applied uh, these definitions. So the Privacy Commissioner will keep a list of best practices. Well, if there is a, a suggestion that uh, privacy has been breached, uh, the uh, Privacy Commissioner will examine whether or not the rules were applied or the regulations. And of course, it all depends on the case, on the particular context. We don't say the generally acceptable practices. They say that which is essential to anonymize, uh, de-identify, if you will. And you have to consider the available technology. Well, essentially, somebody has a rights breached. The commissioner takes a look at that, studies the case, see if the uh, enterprise actually followed best practices, and uh, provides uh, his advice on the issue. Don't you feel that if there was a regulation which would allow the commissioner in advance to determine a number, a certain number of best practices, uh, instead of having the individual having to uh, bring forth a complaint to the privacy commissioner, your uh, digital identity would be lost in that case. Well, we favorize, the law should favorize uh, those practices and guidelines uh, which would allow corporate entities to consult a legitimate source of information. There's two aspects to the use of this. First is standardization or harmonization of a certain practice uh, by business. Uh, economy of uh, no, no, I know I'm interrupting you, uh, and I apologize for that. But uh, this is a necessary conversation here. How do we standardize those processes when the process of de-identification or anonymization is part of a? Uh, it's an a, a, it's a commercial advantage to anonymize. So how can we ensure standardization if we don't have a definition? Well, that's true of a number of standards. There's an objective, an objective, and uh, the method or the processes, like ISO, will create a, a standard to confirm, give their stamp of approval on best practices. And because of the rapid evolution of the technology, uh, well, that's basically the reason why the Canadian network, the Canadian uh, anonymization uh, network, 
and a lot of uh, civil society organizations uh, are, we want to ensure that. We'll be able to increase the number of processes. In fact, it's a basket. Well, uh, I have to ask a question uh, to Mr. Massey. I don't have any problem with the amendment per se, but I don't see what, it, what we're attempting to uh, accomplish with it. Uh, I'd like to better understand the objective that's being followed, for parliamentary speaking. Uh, Mr. Garon is going to be the next speaker on my list, so. Yeah. Question, and um, first of all, I think there's a couple things to clarify with the original discussion that was of, made of this. It was interesting that um, some were attempting to use the privacy commissioner as a reason to get rid of this amendment, when this actually amendment comes from the privacy commissioner himself. And um, it comes and starts on page 14 and 15, and I can provide some clarity on both points that uh, we're making here. First of all, in his submission to ourselves, colleagues, um, it is under the definition of de-identification de and anonymization, recommendation seven, strengthen the framework for de-identified and anonymized information. And what the Privacy Commissioner has said is that the OPC supports the introduction of a new framework for de-identification and anonymization of Bill 1727. The framework has some positive elements, for example. It provides flexibility to organization using de-identification information and adds some needed clarity as how and in what circumstances de-identified personal information can be used and disclosed. So there, right there, that's opening the door for businesses and their ability to use some measures. He continues with, that set is currently drafted. It provides too little protection for de-identified and anonymized data. And this is where we get to uh, some specifics about, I guess, philosophy of this. Uh, best practices, uh, can you name who is going to actually make the best practices, Mr. Shan? As I noted, Mr. Chair, there's a number of, of mechanisms by which generally Not mechanisms, who and what companies will make best practices? Um, Mr. Chair, if I can complete my sentence, I would say that industrial standards organizations, which have a necessity to be tripartite in their formation, including the participation of academics, civil society, as well as industry, are often party to the, to the making of industrial standards. Which yeah, we yeah, those are actually part of them, and that's a basic point we have here, is that you're either siding with the decision of people having de-identification uh, and anonymized information being protected from themselves or having an industry led by Google and others and their associations, some of which actually have other funding and so forth. And what's interesting um, is this issue with regards to uh, the Quebec consistency, and I think it's an important one, a distinction the Privacy Commissioner has addressed. And also, it's also been addressed um, by testimony uh, from Diane Poitras, uh, the former president of Quebec's commission, um, of information, and on specific, um, the Quebec legislation with the relevant provision in Section 23 is this, where the purposes for which information was collected or used are achieved, the person carrying on an enterprise must destroy the information or anonymize it to use it for serious and legitimate purposes subject to any per preservation period provided by an act. For the purposes of this act, information concerning a natural person is anonymized if it is, at all times, reasonably foreseeable in the circumstance that it's irreversibly no longer allows a person to be de-identified directly or indirectly. Information anonymized under this act can be anonymized according to generally accepted best practices and according to the criteria and terms determined by regulation. And part of that in the testimony that we received also from the Privacy Commissioner was because they wanted to fall on the side of caution at that moment. But what's interesting from Mrs. Poitras, the former president of Quebec's commission, as I mentioned, who stated in response to a question that, quote, if I understood correctly, part of your question was whether we are, have any concerns about the interoperability. There are a couple of things I have concerns about. Among other things, there are important distinctions in the regimes applicable to anonymized data and de-identified information. So the door was left open to be actually improve the situation even for the residents of Quebec with regards to having empowerment over some of their data and that there's a quite a comfort level that having this difference is okay. And so what we are really talking about at the end of the day here
is whether or not best practices, which will be industry-led, policed, and determined, used against the OPC, because best practices, if there is a distinction difference, will be used against the OPC, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, with regards to that. So basically, at the end of the day, this boils down having faith in whether the Privacy Commissioner should have control over this measure or whether or not we want it to be industry-led. I'm going to side with the Privacy Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Merci, M. Massé. M. Turnbull, la parole est à vous. Ensuite, j'ai M. Généreux et M. Perkins. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and a great, uh, great debate on an important um, uh, consideration for this bill. Um, just maybe to go back to anonymization is, in our view, privacy enhancing by nature, is it not? Mr. Sean, can you just speak to that? E-enhancing um, mechanism because it it does render the information um, unreidentifiable, and so we see sort of teased out here in various different comments that the um, privacy commissioner in this case uh, is saying essentially if you add generally accepted best practices into the legislation or the definition of anonymization, that this uh, could open the door. I think our position is that it's the opposite, that in fact, uh, you know, putting this in there allows for the evolution and the emergent properties of best practices to help inform. Could you speak to, could you provide a better rationale? Because I feel like this is the main difference that, you know, Mr. Massey is pointing to the OPC, uh, I think, uh, and, and wanting to suggest that he's siding with the OPC. We're not against the OPC. I think the, it's what is the best mechanism to, uh, you know, encourage anonymization and to do so in a way that recognizes that the technology is advancing and evolving. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. I, I, th I think um, absent the terms generally accepted best practices, the definition has nothing but um, uh, a goal, which is which is an incapacity for reidentification. I think uh, our view is that the term generally accepted best practices obligates organizations to continuously ensure that anonymization techniques they use are in line with evolving standards. Um, without the reference to generally accepted best practices in the definition, organizations may determine for themselves what is an appropriate technique, regardless of whether it meets widely recognized standards or even a credible technique. And so I think our view is actually by uh, obligating in the definition organizations to conform to what is the the, the best in class approach to anonymization that that we've actually got a higher standard than just leaving it as solely the goal. Thank you. And if Quebec's law obligates uh, companies to abide by generally accepted best practices, if the law that we end up passing uh, through this committee doesn't include that. What would be the, the risk there? Because it seems like that would compromise interoperability. Wouldn't it also have some kind of an impact on, you know, potentially at least I could foresee that, you know, best practices in Quebec would be recognized, but perhaps not in other provinces across the country? Wouldn't that create some problems? So obviously, I think what we're hoping for um, with the construct of generally acceptable best practices is that um, we set a very high standard that requires corporations to continue to evolve the process and, and ensure that they're using those best possible techniques. If there's an obligation in Quebec to do so, um, but um, not in other places, um, there, there runs the risk that, that some organizations may not be seeking out those best techniques and that we'll have differential privacy depending on, 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 on which law you're conforming to. So, and then the other thing I wanted to ask is, like, who are the experts on anonymization? Because uh, we've heard lots of people reference the privacy commissioner, but I imagine that the Canadian Anonymization Network, who has been asking for this to be included, might actually have more experience when it comes to anonymization uh, than the Privacy Commissioner. Nothing against the Privacy Commissioner. I love the guy. He's fantastic. Uh, dealt with him uh, when he was the uh, legal counsel, and he was just fantastic. Um, so utmost respect for him. But isn't, isn't it true that the Canadian Anonymization Network, or Canon for short, has a lot of experience? And what are they saying about this? 
So, and Canon is a not-for-profit organization that does have representation from public, private, and health sectors in Canada, and also includes the participation of experts in the field of de-identification and anonymization, including Statistics Canada, for whom the anonymization of information is a principal um, consideration. And so, um, I, I do think there is a, a, a well of capacity and expertise in their recommendation that generally acceptable best practices is a, is a, is a useful standard to hold people to. Thank you. And then to the point that this is one of the strengths of including this is that it evolves. I think some of the comments we've heard from others suggest that if it's not an exhaustive list today, that in, in essence that that provides some ambiguity, that that will be taken advantage of. That, But I think that the, the opposite is the case. The argument can be made that while it needs to evolve because the pace at which the technology and the, and the methods for anonymization are changing, uh, are changing quite quickly. So, but I guess, like, how do you ensure that uh, the OPC can, I mean, like, what's the mechanism for continually updating that? Because I think that's kind of the clarity that a lot of us sound like we need to have in order to feel like this is robust enough that it's not going to open that door. So how do we comp contemplate or envision uh, the sort of general guidance uh, around generally accepted best practices evolving? Would it be the OPC guidance? And, and where would the expertise come from? I'll defer to Mr. Chabra on this one. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think it's important to recognize that <clears throat> de-identification and anonymization techniques live on a spectrum. Anonymization is at the far extreme end. De-identification is something f far more simple. The committee uh, in its earlier deliberations today referenced some cases that, that go back to um, kind of the mid-2000s where information was stripped out of a data set and it was easy to re-identify it. And that's exactly the kind of issue that we're trying to combat by establishing a higher bar for anonymization. Anonymization techniques are generally algorithmic in nature. They involve things like differential privacy or uh, um, k-anonymization. These are very sophisticated mathematical algorithmic techniques that, of course, because they're algorithmic in nature, can over time have their efficacy degraded as other algorithms as are developed as new mathematical techniques are developed, as computing becomes more powerful vis-a-vis -vis quantum computing, for example, there are opportunities downstream for what was one point considered anonymous in nature to later, in a matter of, of years, become much more easy to break. And so the reason for including a, a standard that says generally accepted best practices is because it requires an organization to continually review and update. The whole point of anonymization in the context of the act here is to ensure that anonymized, truly anonymized data can be used for beneficial things like improving health informatics, improving health system and delivery. When it is at risk of re-identification, it means it's then back into the auspices of the act and all the requirements apply. In practice, the way we would see the uh, Office of the Privacy Commissioner using a generally accepted best practices requirement is if there were a case in which there were a security breach or that per personal information was leaked they would then be able to go and point at the act and say, the act requires that you anonymized in accordance with generally accepted best practices. And we can or cannot find evidence that you have done so or that you've maintained a, a, a modernity or contemporaneously with generally accepted best practices. So maybe you did it you know, eight years ago or 10 years ago, but then you left the data set alone and it became breachable. What this does is it requires a constant evolution of standards that say, if you're going to try to maintain this as being an anonymized data set and the protections that that includes, you have to keep updating the standards by which you've applied that, that anonymization. So in essence, because anonymization uh, includes not being able to re-identify and, and the anonymization process and techniques are evolving quite quickly, you know, that if you don't have this, then what's the risk? The risk to me is that um, perhaps it goes out of date or organizations, companies are not keeping up with the pace of those generally accepted best practices. So what's the big risk, though, in terms of the public and privacy concerns? Because uh, Ms. Uh, Samir or, or Mr. Shabra, your comments really um, sort of point to a risk that I haven't heard anyone talk about yet, which I think is part of the main point why why our position is against removing this, this clause. 
It, we've 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 acknowledged the, the the construct of anonymized information, but have set the bar um, for essentially um, uh, um, its usage um, very very high. Um, a no no reasonable prospect of of reidentification, and second of all, conformity to um, to the generally best practices. And I think absent that, the worry is. Um, the commitment is solely to the purposes of non-reidentification, and um, um, it doesn't necessarily provide that ongoing obligation back to industry to say, actually, have you assured yourselves that you're continuing to meet the new, the new, the new bar? So that bar is continuously moving. Uh, so the standard that we're setting is something that will continue to increase as technology evolves. And that obligation for those companies would then be tethered to that moving target, which is that you know the standard best practices are going to have to be followed, and they're going to they can't just check out and use outdated anonymization techniques and forget about staying uh, up to date with the best practices. Am I right? That's correct, and essentially ensures that, as opposed to having a potential for uh, a re-identification test that then is that, that that then ultimately results in a breach and then is revealed by the privacy commissioner to not have met the standard. Instead, there's a there's there's two elements. There's there's a non-re-identification and a commitment to the use of generally acceptable best practices, which means that you're continuing to ensure that you're actually drawing on the techniques that that are that are readily that are that are most most modern. And maybe just a, a final point, um, just to really punch home the point that th this, leaving this in, in other words, not taking it out, which the NDP have proposed, continues to align Canada's legislation with Quebec's privacy law. And also, I would just want to point to the fact that our next amendment, which is in consideration, uh, which Mr. Massey read out, the Quebec law is on reasonably foreseeable risk. We're also including to further align our legislation with Quebec's uh, privacy law. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thanks, Chair. Merci beaucoup. J'ai Monsieur Généreux. Thank you, Mr. Généreux. Uh, to the witnesses. The series of questions I'd like to ask you is not on the amendment per se, but on the process which has led to this uh, motion or amendment. Uh, the definition is very important for the bill. Uh, you would agree with that, I'm sure. And uh, on the interpretation uh, of the bill, uh, if and when sanctioned. Now, my question is not uh, any accusation here, but I just want to understand the process. The government tabled this uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we began hearing witnesses, and we have over 50 uh, government-sponsored amendments. Are you uh, the drafter of this uh, bill? Uh, no, I, not personally. <laughs> I work in concert with uh, uh, my colleagues at the um, uh, Justice Department to ensure that, uh, but policies established by the minister last September, the minister, uh, the government brought forth a number of amendments, uh, which uh, were the result of some consultations, because this was done after the tabling of the uh, the bill. Uh, the, you you have consulted with approximately uh, 300 uh, parties, and uh, but during the consultation, some people were called. They weren't in the uh, original 300, uh, and they complained that they weren't consulted, or they would have liked to have been consulted. Uh, we we've been told on many opportun on many occasions that there should have been more consultation on this bill. So today, we're dealing with a series of amendments, uh, this one uh, and another, which demonstrate once again that uh, some people wanted uh, to uh, 
challenge or test uh, your drafting of the bill. Uh, I suppose the reaction was more intense in certain cases than other. The uh, anonymization uh, network, for example, we met with them a number of times. Uh, what uh, what was the need? Uh, why why did you have to consult them over a dozen times uh, on that? But the analysis that we've had here at the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Look, uh, uh, we're uh, fully open to hearing from anybody who wants to discuss this uh, bill. And my response. Uh, is, has been the same. Uh, uh, perhaps not myself personally, because, uh, but I mean, uh, I'm busy. I'm here before the committee uh, fairly often. There's two important aspects to your question, I believe. You've also consulted with uh, Canadian Marketing Association and Canon. Uh, that's a separate, uh, it's a non-profit organization and network as well, uh, uh, constituted with a number of experts. It's also a, a not-for-profit, also with the university sector, uh, academia. And they've had m numerous meetings. on the bill, uh, because of their interest in it, of course. And my, my uh, response has uh, always been I'm prepared to hear them out. Well, the amendments that you're now proposing, be because you withdrew one that was proposed by the minister in September, and now we have about 50-ish uh, proposed amendments uh, made by the government. Now, did this occur after you've met with those other groups, or uh, uh, particularly those witnesses that did appear uh, before the committee, or, and or, uh, further meetings that you've had with uh, other groups, which you might have met with uh, about a dozen times? Well, it's, it, it's not a linear uh, relationship. I mean, uh, one meeting and then w and it brings forth one amendment. Uh, we have people come forward with a specific interest, uh, and it's up to the department to analyze that and see uh, that the bill uh, continues to uh, meet or attain the objectives uh, that are determined by the, the the cabinet and the minister. Okay, I'll come back to the actual uh, amendment that we're looking at. The government is proposing a new definition uh, via the NDP. Or is proposing another definition, a different approach, based on the Quebec uh, bill. What's the government's intention? Uh, in modifying or not modifying the definition, which we believe is a little less uh, appropriate than the uh, definition proposed by the NDP because it is uh, consistent with the Quebec bill. So for those that uh, perhaps uh, lobbied you to try to influence you uh, a dozen so or so times, uh, are you still meeting with them, uh, even today, presently? Well, <laughs> double-barrel question there. Um, it's important to clarify it there. One uh, NDP amendment, which deletes a few words in the definition which are in the proposed bill, uh, which was initially proposed, uh, 
And the uh, definition that we had initially is, in fact, in keeping with uh, the Quebec uh, legislation. And the reason for this is to encourage the use of anonymized data because it, in, it improves or increases uh, the uh, privacy uh, of our Canadian citizens. And it, uh, it can, it's in keeping and respects the spirit as well as the letter of the uh, Privacy Act. Uh, well, the law is in effect, the Privacy Protection Act is in fact, but many stakeholders uh, brought forth uh, some analyses are at the base of this uh, recommendation, which was proposed in May uh, 2022. Do you believe that the number of representations made by certain groups, uh, some much more frequent than others, might leave the impression that the industry is trying to uh, lighten uh, lighten the bill uh, or make it easier for them to facilitate their work, uh, 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 trying to protect fundamentally privacy rights. The goal of the bill is to protect Canadians and their privacy. Did you have the feeling that these organizations were uh, wanted to, well, can I use the expression, water down uh, the, the bill so it would be easier for them to interpret it? Well, I, I can't really uh, give a, an opinion on the intent of these groups, but uh, in my conversation with them, uh, various sectors, there's usually two objectives. To have something that is of a high enough standard to make it clear and that can be implemented. And the second objective is, in fact, to protect uh, uh, the private data of citizens. Uh, to, to remove the ambiguity. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Genereux. Mr. Perkins, followed by, well, we'll start with you, uh, and then we'll carry on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, witnesses. Um, take a step back, Mr. Shen. What's the purpose of anonymization? Um, as Mr. Jabra explained, there's a continuum of, of um, privacy enhancing nature of kind of the state of a, of a, of a piece of information. Um, on the one end is anonymization, um, which essentially renders it uh, uh, um, uh, incapable of being able to re-identify the individual. And then on the other hand would be um, uh, um, fully, fully uh, um, <laughs> Declarable, or I don't know what the what the right term is, but essentially, essentially understood who the individual is and its in, and its fullness. And I think the goal is to is to create a continuum of likely states of information, um, and recognize their existence um, in the commercial context, which the CPPA will regulate, and ensure that um, appropriate safeguards are placed a, a, along each sides of the along each st stage of the continuum. Um, to, and then encourage potentially the, the usage of information in, in, the, in those states with the appropriate um, safeguards in place at each stage. So what's the, uh, what's the purpose of a, a company being forced to take it to that final uh, test of making sure it's anonymized? Um, is it because they're sharing it outside their organization, or w what is the purpose for that? Because if it's information you've gathered internally, obviously through your customer base or whatever, you don't need to anonymize unless you're sharing it in some way. <clears throat> uh, I think um, 
the use cases for anonymized information would vary, but I think there is an understanding that information potentially can be um, still rendered useful, potentially either within the organization or outside of it. Um, because again, even within the case of identified information, um, it, it needs to be prescribed to the purposes for which it was, was collected and, and, and only utilized. Um, uh, and we, the, the law specifically states that people should minimize in, in, information only for its most necessary uses. And so even in the case of in one's own organization, there would be use cases potentially for which anonymized information might still be valuable, um, but, but um, wouldn't rise to the level of, of providing either de-identified or identifiable information to those parts of the organization, um, because there's not a, a use case specific to why it would, it would leap to that level. Um, Particularly in increasingly large and aggregated data sets, they, they can have value um, without necessarily needing identifiable information there within. So uh, as an example, I'll just draw it to my past life as a, <clears throat> as a retail marketer. Um, I would be a member of a coalition program. A coalition program are programs like Air Miles. Uh, uh, we would collect and get access to the data of what our customers would be using Air Miles for and how it would impact the sales. But we also could get access to data. We could also get access to data from Air Miles more generally uh, of what people are doing of certain profiles, but it wouldn't necessarily be with an individual identifier on it. It would be people in a certain income bracket or geography or whatever have these other purchasing patterns so I could draw some conclusions. That, that's a case where I might be buying or getting anonymized data as a marketer. It's that kind of thing, right? <clears throat> yeah, I think the use case would determine whether or not that information was de-identified or anonymized. Right. And, and I think in many cases where people think they might be dealing with anonymized information, they're actually dealing with de-identified information. All depends on what their terms of uh, use are when they signed up for in this case, air miles or something else. Well, no, it, 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 it actually depends on, on, on the, 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 uh, the techniques that have been utilized to strip out any personal identifiers. Right. So, so a de-identified set like a loyalty program um, may still have enough discernible information to actually constitute itself to be identifiable or de-identified, sorry. So they would not rise to the level of anonymous information. They would actually, re they, so, they'd actually still be, st st still be considered to be de-identified. And that's a great point, because we had, we had testimony from uh, organizations like Canadian Marketers Association mm -hmm. and others here before the committee that said it's impossible to anonymize and that this definition was too strong, and from others who said like the Privacy Commissioner and others in the privacy space it actually is, it's just not strong enough language. So um, the idea is to get it to the point where it's impossible to re-identify. But you said uh, a few moments ago that to the point that it's almost impossible. So the purpose of the government is not to get it to impossible, but almost impossible. What do you see as the difference? So I think you'll see in, in G2 the construct of, of reasonably foreseeable, um, which is to say, um, uh, I can't, um, which is another reason why we believe that generally uh, acceptable best practices is an important construct is um, because um, the continued uh, availability of other sets of information, of other techniques, of other kind of com computational tools um, may take what was believed to be uh, anonymized and actually um, shift it. Um, to a world in which it, it could be, which is why continuous conformity to generally acceptable best practices and a standard of reasonably foreseeable, which is I, I, I couldn't have imagined that this was possible, are, are, the, two, uh, are the two nuances I'm, I'm, I'm introducing or suggesting are important when thinking about anonymized information. So uh, in the Privacy Commissioner's submission to us on this issue, I'll go on to read the MP Massey uh, only read a small part. He goes on to say... say in talking about this issue, as currently drafted, organizations could anonymize personal information using generally accepted best practices. That's the term we're discussing here. However, there is no explanation of what these practices are or what would be considered generally accepted. Including this language opens the door to the possibility that some organizations might rely on anonymization techniques promoted by certain expert groups that are insufficient uh, for a given data set. And 
uh, both the liberal members, the government, and yourself have used Canon as an example of a organization that would provide guidance. And I've met with a number of the members of Canon, which include the big five banks, Rogers, TELUS, Loblaws, Sun Life, Microsoft, CRA Canada, Post Stats Canada, Health Canada. I look at those big corporate entities, and I know when I met with those big corporate entities, they weren't interested in a narrow cast of a tight definition because it's not in the, their interest to be able to be restricted in that way. And that's why uh, if you remove this section, I think it puts more mm -hmm. onus on organizations to focus on what the Privacy Commissioner says and interprets. And when the Privacy Commissioner, as we talked about at the last meeting around best interest of the child, uh, the Privacy Commissioner has the responsibility under provisions of this Act to provide guidance to organizations on these areas, does it not? The Privacy Commissioner uh, has the capacity to issue guidance uh, on matters related to the implementation of the Consumer Privacy Protection Act. Right, and that's what he goes on to say in his submission, that the CPPA includes a number of mechanisms for the Office of Privacy Commissioner to assist organizations in meeting their obligations, including providing guidance on privacy management programs, developing guidance materials, and reviewing and approving codes of practice. So. The, the question to me is, I'm not interested that much in what are generally accepted best practices by industry associations. I'm more interested in the power of the guidance of the privacy commissioner, and I'm, I'm reluctant to support a provision that allows anonymization to be watered down to almost impossible, but maybe possible, uh, because the language is given there to allow outside industry associations to set the standard and not the privacy commissioner. So wouldn't you agree that the privacy commissioner is the appropriate uh, office to set these standards, not private sector organizations? So I think you'll find no dispute that the privacy commissioner is the ultimate interpreter of the enforcement of the act. I think as it relates to the techniques utilized for the purposes of anonymization, I think there is important voices to include, including those of academics, there's who are who are party to some of what, what has been encouraged in this space, as well as those of Statistics Canada, of Health Canada, of the Public Health Agency of Canada, all of whom contribute to the view that um, acceptable best practices can be established and upheld outside of, uh, uh, w within this remit. But doesn't the Privacy Commissioner have the responsibility to talk to all of those groups in developing his best, uh, the policies and guidelines? So the consultative uh, obligations of the Privacy Commissioner uh, are um, at, at, at the Privacy Commissioner's discretion. Okay, so again, my preference, and uh, I guess this is where I'll leave mine, I'll just restate that uh, I'm not sure an organization like Canon, which is dominated by the big five banks and the big uh, oligopolistic telephone companies and the insurance companies, and large, large data miners globally like Microsoft are the guide that I want to see in the, driving the policies around Canadian privacy law. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Merci, Monsieur Perkins. <laughs> I should have kept talking a little bit. Avez, vous avez bien choisi votre moment. Et je passerai la parole. Uh, Mr. Viss. As, uh, as we're discussing NDP2, that if NDP2 is adopted, then G2 cannot be moved because there is a conflict of line. I've highlighted that uh, last you. time. I just want to make sure it's on everybody's mind. So, Mr. Viss, the floor is yours. That's well, very helpful, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> just building off this important discussion about widely acceptable standards, earlier today, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Shan did mention that the best practices line that's taken up the majority of the last hour is included in Quebec's privacy law. Is that correct, Mr. Shan? And that's why the government's adopting that language? Uh, that's not the sole origin, but it is noted that it is, it is one of the, the benefits of accepting this language. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, in Clause 5, under the... Uh, purpose and application section of the bill, I should say on page 8, it says, for greater certainty, this act does not apply in respect of personal information that has been anonymized. So the 